Without further ado, please give a warm hand from Thomas Gammeltoft. From, uh, he's the head of industry at the European Writers Club uh, to introduce the opening speaker of TV Drama Vision 2023. Come on stage, Thomas. <clears throat> wow, good to be here. Dear colleagues, dear friends, on behalf of the European Writers Club, I'm honored to once again host, co-host this year's uh, keynote speaker, professor, prof professor in philosophy, formal philosophy, Vincent Hendricks. As director of the Department for Information and Public Studies at the Copenhagen University, Vincent gave us some years ago a fabulous keynote speaker about the importance to speak up our democratic values that we as storytellers, producers, broadcasters, writers, and sales carry on us in bringing on to the audience. And I think we can all agree that this is more important than ever before in these times of uh, war of values. For us in European Producers uh, Writers Club, it's all about inspiring for exchange and collaboration on creating original stories for a larger European audience at once. <clears throat> at all times, we want to raise the bar for innovative and high quality storytelling and strengthen the understanding between our European countries. We want to speak up similarities rather than differences. But to do so, you, to, you need to know who's your audience, who are you speaking to, and what are their behaviors, what are their social mindset, what are they obsessed with, how do they think, which are their biases, is it a generation issue or a general tendency amongst the broad audience, and could this be in the way of the stories we want to tell? Is it all about me, myself, I, as Joan Abbott reading once sang, but I think it was in another meeting and at that time? And this is what we're going to hear about now from Vincent. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Vincent Hendricks and what, what about meism? Take the stage. It's great to be back here. It was three years ago, the last. Um, I'm going to take you through my new book. It's coming out later this year <clears throat> in New York. It's called What About Meism? How Not to Be Personally Pompous, Predictable, and Pathetic. And the reason why I'll take this up is because it's sort of a societal trait that goes through all of us. We have it, we see it ever so often, and we don't like it. So before I get to it, I'll take you back to 1982 because this book has been rumbling around in my head for the past 40 years. Now, in Macmillan 1982, I get for my 12th birthday a Lamborghini Countach, cannonball one type style thing. I loved that car. It was radio controlled. My, mother, my grandmother had brought it back from the US to Copenhagen. It cost a fortune back in the day, so you couldn't even get close to it. But she took it back, and she came it back, and I got it for my birthday. Now, there was a birthday party since it was my 12th birthday. And since it was a birthday party, some of my friends came over. And they looked at this car and they go, we want to try it. But of course, we had to have cakes and we had to have milkshake at the same time. And so at some point, it really dawns on me, I'm not going to be able to try this car if the guys have to try it. So uh, I sat down age 12 and I go, well, what about me? And so I walk up to my father and I yank him in his sleeve and I go, exactly what about me? And my father replies to me sternly. He looks at me, he goes, well, look, what about you? This is not about you, it's about them. Why don't you just enjoy the fact that they get to play with your car without you somehow thinking that you lost out on something on the way? Oh, and while you're at it, make that a rule of life? <laughs> and of course, it took me a while to digest that age 12, but I've sort of tried to see whether or not I could actually live my life like not asking, what about me? And if you look at ourselves every so often, we tend to look what about me? So I was thinking, maybe it's time for me as a professor of formal philosophy to do a game theoretical, a behavioral economics, and a moral determination of this detestful concept, what about meism? And so I'm going to walk you through that, not all of it, but bits and pieces of it, at least, so you get the overall idea. Now, if you look at what it is, it's really asking other people to always flinch when you play chicken. 
So you know the chicken game, right? Two cars are running against each other, right? One wants to get their will, they can swerve, or you can, you can collide, or you can, you can win the game if you have such a fact that you are the one that flinches the last. That's the name of the game. Of course, the interesting thing about game of chicken is you don't know whether or not the other is going to flinch. So what is your best response, whether or not this other person is going to drive ahead or flinch? So playing the game of chicken where you always wanted to have it your way is like playing a game of chicken for which you always ask the other person or you expect the other person always to flinch so you can get it your way. So it's not actually quite a zero-sum game because you rigged the game in such a way that you will always win. And if for one other reason, because what about me? So it's a game of, of a sort of a near zero-sum game for which you have no moral responsibility anymore because that's on everybody else. And there's a good argument that you can have for that, basically that you know better than anybody else what is best for you and your surroundings. And you are also entitled to have it your way because, if for no other reason, what about me? Now, if you think about it from that perspective, it's really something that you find in relationships. So, for instance, uh, married couples where they are trying a second run and they have pre ch ch children from previous marriages and one of them decides that they would want to spend some time with a kid from a previous marriage. And then the partner goes, well, what about my kids? What about me? Why are you spending time with them? Then whatever you spend time with them is not coming to me or mine. So it's a zero-sum game, you can see. If you are doing one thing, you're not doing the other, you can't have it both. So whatever I get is what you lose, or whatever you lose, what I lose is what you get. So you find it in relationship. You also find it among demanding friends, for instance. Why are you spending time with this friend? What about me? Why, why, why don't I get anything? Or is this other friend more important than I am? You, you know about this, right? We, we feel that ever so often. I also went to a party not too long ago where two guys were sitting discussing that their, 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 their stock investments. And one of them had actually succeeded in, in shorting a stock and made a bundle of money on it. And the other guy, who was also a good stock trader on a habitual basis, he did not succeed the same. And of course, he couldn't blame the other guy for his success, but what he could do and what he did was that he blamed the market for it because he was at least as good as the other guy. And so if I can't get it, I'm at least as good. It's got to be somebody's fault. And since it's not the other guys, it's got to be the market. Now, you can say a lot about stock markets, but one thing, they're not, they're not fair. They're not defined to be fair. And I was looking at this discussion. I go, wow, really? So the responsibility for you not actually making a buck is actually the fault of the market. Now, if you go through life like that, you can see it's a tough life because it's not only on your partner or your friends, but it's also on the market, everybody but you. So it's not really about being male or female. It's really about just being human. It's a human trait. It is not stereotypically male or female or one of the 72 genders you can find on Facebook. It's just about being human. So I set up a game and I set up a tale or tales of two people for which it is not important what their gender is, but it is important exactly how they view life. So enter Addison and Madison. Now Addison and Madison are two generic persons, one of them playing the what about meism game, the other one being the victim of the what about meism game, but you, could, you can switch the roles. It doesn't matter whether it's Tilda Swinton or Eddie Redmayne or Eddie Redmayne or Tilda Swinton. Uh, it's just not about that. It's about the kind of game they play between them in their view and way of life. And so, not to take you through game theory as such, which is a well-established discipline, to actually study what others will do in response to what you are doing. Now, many of you have seen A Beautiful Mind, I believe, Russell Crowe, in the role of uh, John Nash, who was one of the biggest game theorists ever, and he came up with what's called the Nash Equilibrium. And the Nash Equilibrium is a special kind of state in which I will do the best I can in response to what you are doing. And that is called the Nash Equilibrium. In the movie, he, it dawns him on, dawns on him when he's looking at his friend picking on his girlfriend, as you might remember. That's not important. But what is important is that Addison and Madison, which of course are unisex names, right? So all the way through the book, I don't mention gender at any point, except where it is important to understand that this is not about gender, it's about human traits. 
they could either compromise or they could get their way, and they feel very differently about either getting their way or compromising. Now, I make out, Adi I make out Madison to be the one who is set on getting its ways, her ways, his ways, Addis Madison's way. Whereas Addison, on the other hand, just has to take it, at least for a while. And then you, when you set up the game like that, you actually get this game of chicken play. But the question is, how can you justify such a game being Madison? And how can you actually take it being Addison? And so I walk you through some of the consequences of this. One of the important things to do is to start out arguing, so why? What is the moral response, where, what is the moral justification for this perspective on life? And basically, when I went through that and I analyzed that in moral philosophy, it's really taking Immanuel Kant and putting him on his head. Now, Immanuel Kant had this idea that only humans can be moral responsible because they have autonomy. Those are the only beings in the world who do have that. And since they have that, they're also based on using reason to reason their way through the path of moral issues. Now one, of big, now, one of the things that Kant was very set on doing was to say that every human being should be treated equal. And human beings are, by definition, treated equal. And if you know, or if you look at the, the, UN, the UN Declaration of Rights, three or four of the articles have a direct, and I mean direct, inspiration from Kant. One of them being, namely, that Kant installed what he called a maxim or his categorical imperative. So how do you act in response to others and what can you take? And he goes to say that you should act according to that maxim whereby you can and at the same time will, that it should become a universal law. So if I present some sort of moral treatment to others, I should be prepared to regain the self from them, right? And that's where the brotherhood or the sisterhood comes in between human beings. Now, of course, uh, what about me is looked at that very differently because I did what the best I could, and that's not good enough. So I'm, getting, I'm not getting my Nash equilibrium, and since I'm not getting it, since I'm doing the best I can, somebody is to blame, and it's not going to be me. And so who is there out there to do it? Or rather, what are other people there to do, or what are my social surroundings there to do? Well, they are that you should act according to that maxim whereby you can, and at the same time will, that others should actually realize your expectations. Look at that in a relationship, right? Well, I'm not going to get a promotion. I just got back from work. You got a promotion. You got back from work. Why don't I get it? And since you ca I can't get it, then somebody else has to take the blame for it. So it's got to be somebody. And I expect you to either understand or do. Well, I'll get back to the expectations part. The other one that Kant had, which was important to him, was what's called his formula of humanity. And that basically says that people should always, humans should always only be used or treated as goals, never as means. But for what about me is it's a different thing, that you should act, you treat humanity in the person of any other, that means excluding yourself, that is, in such a way that they are always means to your ends. Now that's a nasty call, but nevertheless, it's actually there. Now there is an argument why as to this should be the case, why, because you could say, I can understand if you would look at me and say, Vincent, look, that's ridiculous. How could you ever justify that morally? But there's actually an old secular argument for that, namely that it, what does not seem good for the, for the partner is just good for a higher cause, right? That's the classical theodicy argument that you find from Leibniz. It's just because, so if I'm Addison, I'm, I'm going to take the beating from Madison, then really from a higher standpoint, it's actually a good thing because Madison's know better than I what is best for us. Just like the same way that God will know better what is best for humanity, even though it seems as if there's a lot of suffering from in the world, but from a greater point of view and for the greater good, there will be just deserts, and that's just the way it is. So bend over and take it, because from the higher point of view, it's the best. Good, so that's sort of the moral declinations about this. There's also another one here, namely, that one of the things that you get out of a what about me is, is they are always looking to get what other people apparently seem to have it as being successful, okay? So it will be reactionary reproduction of what is already there. If somebody has work has a promotion, I want the promotion. If somebody has a better relationship than I have, I want a better relationship. If they have a better and, more, and, and a bigger car, I want a bigger car too. Just to say, then basically, you are never being very original about what you want. You just want more of the same. 
So in a certain sense, it's really being very Kierkegaardian about it. Because Kierkegaard said in, in either or, now, if you're only a mask, that means that you're only looking yourself in the mirror in your relation to others, then you will be a nothing. There will be no kernel of you left. The only thing you will have left is the mirror image of yourself in relation to others. So you will be, as Kierkegaard would say, a non-entity. Nothing in and by, by yourself, but only in relation to others. And let me tell you something. There are certain companies that are have turned this into their business model. You know who they are? Social platforms. Enough about me, what about you? What do you think of me? That's basically how they make their money. Well, that's also make their money besides selling commercials. I'm not saying that this is wrong, but I'm saying there, there's a lot of social capital you can take and you can turn it into hard capital if you want. So uh, basically, in a certain sense, Ryan Kierkegaard was really ahead of his game here. More I put to the point, namely, you, you must have experienced this ever so often, either in relation to friends or, 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 or partners or something like that, where certain speech acts seems to entail that there is something you should have done, and since you haven't done it, you are breaking my expectations. And so I, I do a whole section where I, the, the chapter is called See It Coming a Mile Away. And much of it has to do with speech acts. Like, didn't you tell them that, do sh that they should do such and so? I know better, so you should tell them. Or my favorite one is when somebody comes to you and, you, and they say to you, I expect that you. And my question, you know, and I always go, look, expectations, expectations from others are only there to be, to be broken, really, right? So you can expect all you want. doesn't mean that you get it. Or uh, I wish you wouldn't. Are you with me in that? Don't, don't you agree me? Don't you agree with me that? You must have heard that. It's basically saying, you take ownership of my point of view, okay? That's the way it's going to go. So there's a whole set of red flags that one should be aware of. Um, pertaining to this. The last one there is actually a self-reflective one. Now I think it's time for you to think of more. So I'm projecting onto you to come up with more examples. And I expect you to do it. And if you don't, I'm going to be disappointed. And consequences will follow from that disappointment. All right, I think you get the picture of this. So if you want it basically cooked down into one thing or the other, uh, in so many words, it's basically like saying, take, so think of a trick-or-treat situation. Think of life as a trick-or-treat. So you trick everybody out trick-or-treating to get the candy. You retain it all yourself while you gaslight and bamboozle your mates and hangarounds into the belief that their treat, what I get out of following you, is that you get all the M&Ms, the Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, and watch McCallit. Watch McCallit is a candy bar in the U.S., then do, this, do the same the next year and the year after that, and as long as you feel triggered, entitled, but unenlightened, knock yourself out. I am not saying that they are what about me is out there, full-blooded. What I am saying is that we might have a trace of it, all of us, one way or the other. And it sneaks in ever so often. It's an unpleasant trait because we basically look pathetic. But if you also think that we are also at the same time no better, then we are pompous. And if it's not what you always do, then we will be predictable. So there's your subtitle. How not to be pompous, predictable, and pathetic. There's also a question of, suppose you are a what about meist. Now the question is, why are you that? What is your argument for being so? And there you have to look at how we feel about risk and how we feel about aversion or being risk-seeking, depending on what is at stake. So suppose you have a relationship for which, for which that you know that this relationship is not great, okay, but I can get my way. I'm pretty sure I can get my way. Then it would be irrational for you <coughs> excuse me, to take out a higher demand on your partner, knowing that if you put out a higher demand, there might be a small risk of this one other person copping out. So rather have a small but sure gain than only a possible but only a larger gain. And so from that perspective, it is good for you to be the coward. You're not going to stand up to your own rights. You can have it pretty much as you want, but you can't have it all the way, and if you start squeezing it, you might lose. So there's an argument for the fact that a what about me is, if that what about me is can get their way without actually sacrificing too much, then you will be a coward. 
insofar as to say you're not really going to stand up to your game, but you're actually getting the best you can given your situations. So you might be a what about meist and being risk averse, but you can always be a what about meist and you can be risk seeking. So suppose you are pretty pretty sure that uh, this relationship is going to go sour, sour right? We, this is going to we're going to this is going to end up in a divorce or my friends are not going to want to visit me. But it's important for me to still stick to my guns. So what do I do? Well, if I'm pretty sure I'm going to lose anyway, well, why not just take the chance? I might win. It's like, it's like doing the one arm jack thing, right? I might win. The possibilities are small, but they're there. Right? They're there. And so if I stand to lose anyway, why not just squeeze all I can? But then I'm really a crook, right? And I'm being very conniving about the way I proceed because I proceed according to a rule that goes, I'm probably going to lose. I might just lose. There's probably at least a big, big chance that I'll lose, but there is a chance that I'll actually get bamboozled and get my way and gaslight my partner into this. So why not? Let's take the chance. So there is an argument for what about me is full-blooded, but either to be risk-averse or risk-seeking, depending on exactly what is at stake here and depending on the chances for either I can win or I can lose in getting my way. Now, I'm almost done here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, one thing you should though notice is that a what about me is, or when what about me is and comes to us, we tend to forget to make distinctions. So for instance, in a relation where you have a nuclear second time around family, where there are offsprings of earlier, then if I spend time with the offspring of my earlier and I'm being called out on that, then it's only because my partner is doing the following, namely, whatever I do is being put into one and the same spreadsheet. We don't make distinctions between you as my partner and this is my offspring. It's all on the same spreadsheet and they are all being weighted according to some. But of course, these are essentially different entries on a spreadsheet. One has to do with your previous family, one has to do with my previous family, one has to do with our initial relation, and some of it has to do with the offspring. But if you order life as is, everything can be prioritized in the same spreadsheet. You're going to be up shit creek without a paddle because then you're going to have to compare incomparable things. Apples and oranges. My previous relation, my previous kid with my current situation. There are two different things. And all of you have, who have tried to do this the second time around, you goddamn well know this. You know it all too well. That sometimes you go, why are you spending time with this when you should have done that for us? But for us it's different here because we are not talking about the same thing. We are talking, we are talking about very separate things. So one of the problems about the what about me is this, is that if you want to look at life as a zero sum game and you order everything in a spreadsheet, then it's every going to be every time it's going to be whatever one gains is somebody else's loss and that's just the way it is. And then you might have to make up for it later. So to keep separate spreadsheets between Addison and Madison because if you do then we can start playing a different kind of game. A game for which a game for which is not either my way or your way where there is actually an overlapping interest if we keep the spreadsheets separate and we decide sometimes that we don't necessarily believe that the other ones know best, but we together figure out the way in which we can do things together. And the reason why I'm saying that is this, and I have four minutes, I think I can handle this. There are games for which we can actually together obtain more than that we could on our individual basis. It's called a stag hunt. We had just been through Corona, right? We remember that a lot of us got used to uh, either, either prime ministers or authorities saying, don't hamster, don't go down and hamster toilet paper and watch my call it. And what did we do? We went down and we hamstered all we could because at least we got some. But had we not hamstered, then actually we have not getting food shortage and we'd all be good. But that depends on the fact that we trust each other for you not to hamster if I don't and I don't if you don't. And if you do, it's the best for me to do it too, actually, because then at least I get some. So basically sometimes the stack hunt is a better hunt to play in a relationship or among friends. Namely, that we actually together can obtain a greater netto than we could if we didn't do it. So life is not a zero-sum game, better yet, Love is not a zero-sum game. 
Friendships are not zero-sum games. But if we look at the world as if it were, then we would be in trouble. And that ability, that cops the situation out because when I asked my father back in the day, what about me? Then basically what he says, it's not about you. It's about us. There's a whole different thing. And the reason why that is important is exactly because what is the purpose of a party? The purpose of the party is to celebrate the person, but the condition for which that could be celebrated is are all the others doing that. Otherwise, they wouldn't show. And so basically, what I'm trying to say here, the party is not, for the par the party is not really for the person in the center. It's for everybody else around it to realize it so that that person feels it. The same thing about these processions where you see the royals travel through these inner streets of cities. Who is the real audience? The real audience is, is the, the center of attention is not the queen, is not the king. It's the audience that makes it possible. Without the audience, there would be nothing. And we should realize that when it comes to life and way of living a life is that it's so much about the audience, the one around us, because those are the ones that can make us feel special. If we insist on the other one, then we can end up in a really nasty game. Because suppose, suppose my Camilla says to me, listen, Vincent, we have been playing this game long enough, okay? I've been bending over long enough, excuse my French. I'm not taking it anymore. So eventually, and I'm not going to tell you when, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to smack you real hard for this. Well, suppose I'm the what about meist, right? See, even the what about meist would say, well, I'm doing all of this for me, okay? I want mine. So I'm going to insist on continuing doing exactly that, getting my way, well knowing that sooner or later, Camilla's going to stand up and she's going to smack me so hard I'll never stand again. That would be extremely irrational of me. Even an egoist or a homo economicus would eventually understand that there is something in it for me to realize goals that I can't realize myself, including keeping my relationship, for us to cooperate. And if I well know that I'm going to stick to keeping my way, yet lose, that would be irrational of me. So I would not even be a homo economicus, I would be a homo moronicus. That basically just means a moron person. And who would want to do that or be there? Now, again, just to finish off, I'm not saying that we are all what about me is. But I am saying that ever so often we do have a trait of being what about me is, and it sucks because then we become pompous, predictable, and pathetic. And that is a terrible trait for human beings to have. And with those words, I think I'll follow as far as Gompen saying, that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Vincent. Sure. Thank you very much.